Um, I'm very thankful to be uh, able to uh, preach and teach this morning uh, as we carry on through the gospel according to Luke. Those of you that are with us here at the Rock Church Squamish, you will know that we have been teaching and preaching through the gospel according to Luke for two years now, has it been? I think just over two years. And we are hoping and praying that by God's grace we will be able to finish it, Glenn, I'm not sure, maybe in spring of 2021. Yeah, that's what we're aiming for. So that will be a fantastic thing to be actually able to uh, complete um, that whole gospel according to Luke. And uh, we are very thankful for what God has done through it and what He has been speaking to us as a church. Now I'm going to start this morning, uh, before we dive into our text, uh, I'm going to share with you a short little story about when I was a high school teacher. Uh, many of you know that I've shared before that I was a, a high school teacher for 12 years. I graduated in South Africa, I taught there for five years and then moved to Canada, taught here for seven years. And uh, then I sensed God called me out of that capacity of teaching students in high school into this capacity of teaching the Word of God in, uh, in church capacity, discipleship capacity, evangelistic capacity. And, um, but I want to share with you something that happened when we were still in South Africa and at a school I was at right before we moved to Canada. I was teaching at a high school that was quite a prestigious sports school. And uh, they had a, a high value for rugby as a South African. It was a great school to teach at and to coach at. But there was not a high view of academics. And what happened with that was uh, with many of my class, class sizes and with the kids that I was teaching, is uh, they were really disinterested in what I was teaching, specifically this one subject that I was teaching. It was business, business uh, economics or studies. And one of those classes was a grade 9 class. And if you know anything about grade 9s or grade 8s and 9s uh, students between the age of 14 and 15 and 16, man, there's a lot going on in their lives. They hit puberty, there's pimples, there's hormonal changes. They are bonkers. They just go all over it, okay? And together with that, I had this one class, and it was a big class. I, I'm guessing it was close to 40 students in my jam-packed, prefabricated classroom, and it was high temperatures in our town that we were living in, high 30s, even as high as 45 degrees Celsius, with no air conditioning. It was insane, okay? Now, on one such occasion that this, I had this specific class that was so disinterested, I just had enough, okay? They were disrespectful, they were not listening, they were all over, and I stood in front of them and I, and I said, hey, do you know with what authority I stand here? And they all went silent and they looked at me and I was like, I'm standing here in the authority of the Lord Jesus Christ. And I could say that because we were predominantly a Christian culture. It was a, pri a public school rather, but we had a Christian ethos and a mandate. So I was able to freely share the gospel or my faith with them. But I stood in that class because I was just like, I had heard enough. And I thought, man, maybe they will listen to me if I do that. And uh, yeah, what happened was, there was a student that sat right in front of me, and I remember, remember his face, and he looked perplexed, and he put up his hand. And I was like, yeah, you got a question. And he's like, Mr. Buta, what does the word authority mean? <laughs> and the whole class just laughed. And I threw my hands up in the air and I said, yeah, no wonder, you don't even know what authority means. And you know what, I, I thought about that story as I was preparing this message today, uh, and I didn't put the title up there, but it's entitled, True Authority That Flows From True Identity. And this episode in my teaching experience happened, and, and I was reminded of it because I felt like God was saying to me, you know, Rudy, you're not that much different than those students and that student that asked that question, what does authority mean? Like, you know a definition of authority, you know that it is a, a kind of a power that is delegated towards someone and then they exercise the right to tell other people or to exercise that kind of authority over people or a situation. But that's the definition. 
but you don't really have a clear understanding of it. And I want to submit that problem to you today. That is the main thesis of today's message. It's, it's, I'm going to try and drive at one point. And the problem is this, that I believe that we see that at play in our lives. We see it at play as the children of God, as Christians. And we see it at play in large in society that we really do not have a good understanding of what true authority means and what it is. You know, if you're anything like me, you would maybe have to admit that the majority of the time when someone tells you what to do, you resist it. If you're anything like me, when you're pulled over by the RCMP, even though you were speeding, there is something inherently within us that wants to justify what we have done. I just arrived in Canada as a South African, and in South Africa, we we predominantly speed. It's, a, it's a, a lot of adrenaline in South Africa because of the high crime rates, and, and we have got a, a speed limit of 120 on the highway. But if it says 120, the rule of thumb is that means you, you can go 140. And so when I arri arrived in Canada, I was pulled over twice for speeding. But I knew I was guilty, but something inherently I was rebelling against. I was like, oh, you cops, you RCMP, you're all the same. You just wait for us poor South Africans that come here and to pull us over and to discriminate against us. Okay, That's kind of like inherently that was in me. And I want to submit to you that we see this at play in culture. If we just look at 2020 so far, how do we see us as people in general and society respond to authorities that make decisions? How do we respond to governing authorities such as prime ministers and presidents and public health authorities and decisions that they make? What happens on Facebook or social media? Is that, is that truly a reflection of people who understand what authority is? Or are we missing something? And so that problem for me, again, I'm going to throw it out there again. I, I believe we do not have an understanding of the nature, the true nature of what authority is. And I want to say that it, we, we do not understand it because we do not know who we are. We don't have a thorough understanding of our identities. So I don't have it up there, but I've got a, a, a one big point. That true authority is derived from true identity. And true identity can only be received and not earned. I'm going to say that again. True authority is derived from identity, or true identity, and true identity can only be received and not earned. Now, that's a very nice thing to say. It's, it's going to be great. But I want to substantiate it now. And if you're new here at the Rock Church, the way that we go about doing it is looking at authority. We believe that the Bible is that authority that gives us the answers to life's biggest questions. It's not Rudy that is now here today telling you something or trying to be clever. If what I'm telling you cannot be substantiated through Scripture, I'm in trouble. So that's what I'm going to try and attempt to do here today. And so before we dive into this text, let's just pray. Yeah, Father God, we thank you for the privilege to be gathering, for the privilege to be here, to come and bring ourselves before you as an almighty, all-knowing, all-powerful, and a loving God. You are a gracious and a compassionate God. And we come in and we bring ourselves before you and we want to come and place ourselves underneath your authority and your author authoritative word. And so I come and ask in the name of Jesus, Lord, come and help us. Help me. Holy Spirit, you are welcome. Come and teach us. And lead us in your ways. In Jesus' name. Amen. So we are in Luke 20 verses 1 to 8. I'm not sure, am I currently in control of this? Yeah. Oh, there we go. Okay, that's not the one that I wanted to show. Okay. We're in Luke 20, 
We're going to look at verses 1 to 8 first, and then I've got a couple of observations to make, and then we will go from verses 9 to 18 at the end. And it says there, One day, as Jesus was teaching the people in the temple and preaching the gospel, the chief priests and the scribes with the elders came up and said to him, Tell us by what authority you do these things. Or who is it that gave you this authority? He answered them, I also will ask you a question. Now tell me, was the baptism of John from heaven or from man? And they discussed it with one another, saying, If we say from heaven, he will say, Why did you not believe him? But if we say from man, all the people will stone us to death. For they are convinced that John was a prophet. So they answered that they did not know where it came from. And Jesus said to them, Neither will I tell you by what authority I do these things. So once again, we have Jesus on the scene. And there is a group of people, we, we have come to know them as the religious elite of the day, the scribes, the lawyers. In this scenario, we see it's the chief priests, scribes, and the elders. And they are in conflict with Jesus. They're really ticked off with Jesus once again. They are the ones with the PhDs, with the master's degrees, the experts in theology. And they have got their, yeah, they've got their arms up the air, questioning Jesus about his authority. Now, for us to understand exactly why they have got such an issue with what Jesus is doing, we we got to understand what the cultural context and the historical context was of this situation when Jesus is now in Jerusalem. Because we know from the previous chapter, chapter 19, that Jesus had been preaching and teaching in the regions outside of Jerusalem for the majority of the time during his ministry, but then now he is now finally going into Jerusalem, which is the capital of Israel and where God's kingdom was going to supposedly be established. And he is heading there together with his disciples, and he is entering the city of Jerusalem right before this festival, the festival of Passover. And we've got to understand what the Passover is in order to really understand what is going on here in this situation where they come and approach Jesus and confront him on his authority. You see, Jesus came in as this humble king on a donkey. And the people were shouting, Blessed is he who comes in the name of the Lord. Blessed is this king. And he was representing for these religious leaders totally the opposite of what they wanted to see. They wanted to see a military Messiah come in, uh, an anointed one, a king that was going to come and obliterate their oppressors, the Roman Empire. But they had forgotten the true meaning of Passover. They had forgotten that the Passover was not about them, but it was about God and what He had done for them and given them an identity. The Passover was instituted and basically happened 1,430 odd years before Jesus. And for those of you that don't know the story, it plays out in the life of a man called Moses. There's a movie, a Disney movie, The Prince of Egypt. Go and watch it. If you've never watched it, that's what the story of Moses or the story of Israel is about, the Passover. And what it is about is it is the nation of Israel that are in the land of Egypt and they are oppressed. They are under an oppressive regime. They are enslaved for 400 years and they groan and they call out to God and God hears their call. And he raises up a man called Moses. 
And he instructs Moses to go to this leader, to go to the Pharaoh and tell the Pharaoh, listen, let my people go. And so God, who is the God of the Hebrews, Yahweh is the God of Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob. He gives the Pharaoh multiple opportunities to let the people of God go and to repent. In total, 10 opportunities. But with every opportunity where he rejects God, God sends a plague. God sends a plague over the nation of Egypt that is in response to each and every false god that Egypt was worshipping. Because the Egyptians were polytheists. They were worshipping the sun, the moon, the stars, and all other kinds of images and idols that they had made. They were worshipping creation. They had their identity based on what they thought were gods. And so God came, He gave them nine, what is that? Is that the amp? <laughs> Got something going on here. Um, God gave them nine opportunities. And still the Pharaoh rejected God's opportunity. And finally, God said the final plague was going to be that the firstborn child of every household in the nation of Egypt will die. But God made a way for the nation of Israel, His people. He instructed Moses that this is what every household of Israel will have to do. They have to choose a one-year-old male lamb, a perfect spotless, blameless lamb, slaughter that lamb and take the blood of that lamb and place it on the doorposts of their houses. They had to then that night barbecue the meat, eat it together with unleavened bread and get ready to move. Those of you that when we were singing the songs and you were singing about the blood of the lamb or the blood of Jesus, it comes from that Passover because what happened was God then came, he brought that plague on the firstborn children, but because the blood of the Lamb was on the doorposts, God passed over the nation of Israel. They were spared the wrath of God. They were spared this punishment for not acknowledging God for who He was. And so the identity of Israel as the people of God was firmly established with them being able to leave Egypt. And God led them through miraculous signs and wonders through the desert, to a land called Canaan, the land of milk and honey. And 1,400 odd years after that, guess who arrives on the scene? Jesus Christ as the fulfillment of that lamb that was slain 1,430 odd years before his time. And that is... What the Passover was, and that is where, why Jesus is heading towards Jerusalem. It's Passover. It is an appointed time that had been set before the foundations of the world that there was going to happen something significantly that was going to bring not just the nation of Israel into a close relationship with God, but the whole world. You see, these religious leaders had forgotten that the Passover and the mission that God had given His nation, Israel, was to be a light to the Gentiles. In other words, their mission from the start was to convey this message to the rest of the world. That, hey, God is a loving God. He is a gracious God. He wants to know you because He created you. But you see... The religious order of the day had forgotten their identity. And they had made it about a message, well, it's about our identity that we can establish by what we do. How many of the good things we can do. How many of the 613 laws we can keep because we believe we can keep it all. And so they were placing this heavy burden on people. Now, I quickly want to show you this map here of what the temple looked like, the temple complex. Because we read here, Jesus is teaching and preaching in the temple, and we can easily think, oh, he's in the temple. But if we do not understand what the complex looked like, we will miss what's going on here. Not sure if you can see that little laser there. And the people online, you're not going to see anything, so I'm sorry. <laughs> but everyone that's here will be seeing something. Okay? Okay. Um, that building right there in the middle, this beautiful tall one, that's the actual temple. And this is Herod's temple. And in this temple, 
That's where we had two sections. You had the holy place in the beginning, and then there was a curtain and a veil that separated the holy place from the holy of holy places, the holy of holies. And the holy of holies was kind of like here at the back, and that's where the Ark of the Covenant was. That's where the presence of God dwelt. And only one person could go into this temple once a year to make atonement for the sins of the nation. And that was the high priest. Okay? Around the temple, you had different buildings or different sections that had various purposes. You had different courts. This is a court, the court for the women. This was the court for all the Israelites. And from here, this is where the people came to worship. They came... Because over here, right in front of the temple, that's where the slaughtering of the lambs would take place. That's where people would bring their sacrifices and offerings during the Passover. But around this area, there were other courts as well. Out of this area, this wide area, was actually the court of the Gentiles. And that is what we see at play in Luke 19. Jesus is appalled with what's going on in the court of the Gentiles because what that means is it's the court for outsiders. It's so that those who do not understand or know God or they're seeking, they can come close and they can listen. They can hear the word of God preached. Now, the big question is where was the word of God then preached? In this area, here where there are some steps, and this was a specific area where the Sanhedrin, the religious elite, dwelt and where they hung out. And specifically during the Passover, that is where they preached to the people. And so you would have people in this area gathered to come and hear what these religious people were teaching. And so I believe that it could be very much so that where these religious people were actually to take their position of authority... Their pulpit. Guess who is standing there at the Passover and who's actually now teaching the people? Jesus. Jesus. And they are ticked off. And they are questioning his credentials. They are basically asking him, show us your PhD, show us your master's degree. What do you think you're doing? This is our pulpit. We teach you. That's what they're actually saying to him. Because he had come in as this meek and humble king. He was appalled by what was going on in the court of the Gentiles. Overthrew or overturned the tables. Going all violent on them. Righteous, a righteous violence or anger. But then he has moved now into their pulpit. So, Jesus does this in a specific point in time where thousands upon thousands upon thousands of people are listening to him. And based on what we know from the start of his ministry, people understood that Jesus had authority. They listened to his words. In Luke 4 verse 32, it says they were astonished by it, at his teaching for his word possessed authority. And further on in Luke 4, it says, They were all amazed and said to one another, What is this word? For what, with what authority and power he commands the unclean spirits? And they come out. And reports about him went out in every place and surrounding region. And so the people were there. They were in expectation. They were hanging on his lips. They were eating up everything that he was teaching and preaching. Except for these religious folks. And then we see this exchange. They question him. But in typical fashion of Jesus, he doesn't respond like Rudy. He doesn't go, well, I'm here with the authority of the Father. <laughs> no, he responds with a question. Because he knows they want to lead him into a trap. They want to hear him say that he is God himself, that he is the Messiah. They want to hear that in this place, so that they can accuse him in front of everyone of blasphemy and that they can kill him. That's what they want to do. But you see, he knows his identity and he knows their hearts. He knows their plans. 
And so he throws out this question. He says, hold on. John the Baptist, who came before me, my cousin, who came preaching and teaching a message of the kingdom of God, is about repenting of your sins and not ripping people off, doing the right thing and following God with a broken and a contrite spirit. That's basically what John the Baptist preached and he came baptizing people with that. He's saying, listen, that guy, John the Baptist that was killed, was he of God? Or did he make that up? Like, was, was that just a man-made message? And we see then their response. They are in trouble. They are backpedaling and they quickly huddle together like, okay, guys, uh, we're in trouble here. <laughs> He's done it again. <laughs> He's done, I can't believe we stepped into this again. He's done it so many times to us. Here we are again. What do we do? Because if we say, yes, John the Baptist was a prophet of God, He's going to tell us, why didn't you guys listen? And that means we lose all credibility in front of the people. And if we say, well, he was just of man, the people will kill us because the people knew and they believed that he was of God. And so they try and regroup. And Jesus is the one who exercises the authority here. They try and rattle him with this question. He poses a question back. They are rattled. And what card do they then play? They say, we don't know. They play the agnostic card. It's kind of like the card that so many of us play. And we say, I'm not sure. I don't, I don't think there's a way to know whether there is a God. I'm not sure if we can truly say, if we look at the universe and the stars and the sun and everything that lines up and, and the galaxies upon galaxies, and if we look at the fact that there is only one planet in this entire galaxy that's got life on, on it and the, the, the perfect circumstances for life, I'm not sure if, we are, if there's a way to know if there is a God. It's kind of like that card that they throw out. We're not sure. But Jesus responds with authority back to them and he says, then I will also not tell you by whose authority I'm doing this. Because they had had opportunity after opportunity after opportunity, just like Pharaoh, to see his authority. They had witnessed his miracles. They knew that he had performed miracles that only the Messiah could do. They saw his life. They knew that he was sinless. He had not broken any of God's commandments. And the only reason why Jesus is able to do this is because he understands his identity. He can exercise true authority because it flows from true identity. My main point that I'm driving at here again is that true authority is derived from true identity, but true identity cannot be earned. It can only be received. What I want us to see is that these religious people were exercising an authority that they thought they earned. They thought they were really good. But they had actually a false authority. There was no authority because they had forgotten their true identity. But if we move on, we then see Jesus indirectly respond to this question. He makes them look like idiots and fools, but then he does respond to give them the answer to the question that they ask. And we read this in Luke 20, verses 9 to 18. It says there, And he began to tell the people this parable. A man planted a vineyard and led it out to tenants and went into another country for a long while. When the time came, he sent a servant to the tenants so that they would give him some of the fruit of the vineyard. But the tenants beat him and sent him away empty-handed. And he sent another servant, but they also beat and treated him shamefully and sent him away empty-handed. And he sent a third, 
This one also they wounded and cast out. Then the owner of the vineyard said, What shall I do? I will send my beloved son. Perhaps they will respect him. But when the tenants saw him, they said to themselves, This is the heir. Let us kill him so that the inheritance may be ours. And they threw him out of the vineyard and killed him. What then will the owner of the vineyard do to them? He will come and destroy those tenants and give the vineyard to others. When they heard this, they said, Surely not. But he looked directly at them and said, What then is this that is written? The stone that the builders had rejected has become the cornerstone. Everyone who falls on that stone will be broken to pieces, and when it falls on anyone, it will crush him. Jesus gives them this story, and just like with so many other occasions, he gives them a parable that they will immediately recognize what the story is about. He talks about the fact that there is an owner of a vineyard. And when they would have heard vineyard and this owner of a vineyard that got planted, they would have immediately remembered Isaiah 5 that talks about the fact that that vineyard is Israel. And the owner of that vineyard is God. God is the one who chose Israel, planted them, settled them in the land of Canaan. The tenants were the religious leaders then. They were the custodians. They were the ones who were supposed to cultivate the vineyard so that good fruit would come from it. The food, the food of righteousness, justice, loving mercy, walking humbly. And the servants in the story, that's basically the history of Israel of how they had fallen into sin and how God had sent prophets to warn them, to tell them, repent, turn back to God, turn back to God. And one prophet after the other got rejected and killed or persecuted. But through the story, he reveals that, listen, the owner has a son, an heir. And so he is, through the story, acknowledging to them that that is who he is. He is the son of the Most High God. He is the Messiah. He is God incarnate. God, Emmanuel, with us. And immediately, he answers the question of authority. By what authority are you doing these things? And he reveals his true authority or the reason for his authority because it is derived from the identity as a son of the Most High. You see, this confronted the issue at stake in their hearts, that there was evil, there was sin, pride. And he asks them this question in verse 15 relating to what the consequence will be for those who, in the end, reject the Messiah. He asks them, listen, this is what has happened with the nation of Israel. But they had rejected everything that God had given them. And he reveals to them the plan of salvation from God. He says that what will happen is that this privilege of being identified, having been identified as the children of God, the ones who are supposed to be the representatives of God's grace on the earth, that privilege was going to be given freely by grace to others. And when he says this, he is referring to other nations, to the Gentiles, because that was God's heart from the start of creation, that all people would come to know and have faith in him. And their reaction, once again, proves their pride. They say, surely not, this will not happen. God will not take this privilege away. And he says that, in fact, this is what will happen. There will be a consequence. And so what he does is he 
then uses a prophecy again out of Psalm 118, where he says, what does this mean then? That the stone the builders rejected has become the cornerstone, and anyone who falls on this stone will be broken, and on anyone it falls, that, that person will be crushed. And it refers back to a prophecy that indicated that Jesus was going to be rejected. They will reject the Messiah. And so with this parable, he warns them. He says, this is going to be the consequence if you reject the Messiah, my authority. You will fall over me as the stumbling stone. I will be a stumbling block for you. I will be that cornerstone on which you are going to be broken. It's going to crush you. There will ultimately be a consequence of everlasting destruction if you do not repent. Because a cornerstone was the most important stone that was laid in masonry or with buildings that were built from brick or stone. And everything else that is built from that house follows that direction, the precision of that stone. So Jesus was telling them that I am that cornerstone for life. I am the one that lays the foundation on which everything needs to be built. Now the question is, what does this mean for us? How do we apply it to our lives? We can easily look at this encounter and we shake our heads and we say, goodness me, religious leaders, how many times do you want to make the same mistake? How could you not see the Messiah? But if we are totally honest, we suffer from that same problem. The identity problem. We do not know who we are as people. We do not know who we are as Christians and who God calls us to be and to accomplish. We too come to Jesus and we ask like the religious leaders, Jesus, tell me by what authority are you Telling me how I need to live my life. By what authority are you telling me how I need to practice my sexuality? By what authority are you telling me how I need to spend my money? By what authority are you telling me how I need to structure my family and raise my children? By what authority are you telling me to love people? And we come with those same questions, that same attitude. Knowing that God has actually already shown us. He has revealed himself to us in Jesus Christ. We reject the authority of his word. We reject the Bible. We come to the Bible with our own intentions, our own desires. I want the Bible to tell me what I want to do. And we come and say, well, listen, Jesus, I will maybe follow you and trust in you if I could just have one more, if there was one more gospel, if there was one more guy that came and he gave an account of your life, man, then I will believe. But we then ultimately fall for that trap that these religious leaders trapped in, uh, stepped into. They were worshipers of self. So they were not agnostics. They were in actual fact contemporary Gnostics. They were worshipping themselves. They were placing themselves in authority instead of God. And we see this at play in our culture today even more so. A culture that has turned away from God, turned away from the truth of God. And it is the worship of self. If we see it on Facebook, we see it in the social media, it's about receiving an identity that is based on how people view me. It's based on an identity I get from hashtags and likes and shares. The gospel of self. There is a poem that was written by an English poet called William Ernest Henley. The poem's title is Invictus. 
And it was a poem that was recited and memorized frequently by Nelson Mandela. And if you do not know who Nelson Mandela was, go and Google him. And he was a, lib a liberator of the people of South Africa and, and spent 27 years in jail. And the poem goes something like this. Out of the night that covers me, black as the pit from pole to pole, I thank whatever gods may be for my unconquerable soul. In the fell clutch of circumstance, I have not winced nor cried aloud. Under the bludgeoning of chance, my head is bloody but unbowed. Beyond this place of wrath and tears looms but the horror of the shade, and yet the menace of the years finds and shall find me unafraid. It matters not how straight the gate, how charged with punishments the scroll. I am the master of my fate. I am the captain of my soul. I want to point out to you that the last stanza of that poem is in direct contrast to Matthew 7, verse 14, where Jesus says, Straight is the gate, and narrow is the way, which leadeth unto life, and few there be that find it. This poem talks about our culture. This idea that I am the master of my fate, I am the captain of my soul, and I am sorry to say, unfortunately, Nelson Mandela was meditating on the wrong statement there. Because it is in direct contrast to what Jesus Christ was saying. I cannot speak into his beliefs, but that is what I know from the Word of God. We believe we are the masters of our fate over of our own souls and we live that out in the way that we respond to authority and it comes from a misunderstanding of our identity. I want to conclude with this. I shared in the beginning how I stood in front of that class. I had the credentials, I had the teaching qualifications, I had the experience, but I struggled to gain the respect of those students because I did not understand my identity. I was not living with true authority in my sphere of influence because I did not understand that living from the true identity of who God calls you to be, a child of God, a child of the Most High God, an heir to the throne, Paul says, if you're in Christ, you are an heir with Him. And I did not understand the authority that Jesus had and what He called me to be and do when He said this in Matthew 28, verse 18 to 20. He says, And Jesus came and said to them, All authority in heaven and earth has been given to me. Go therefore and make disciples of all nations baptizing them in the name of the Father, of the Son, and of the Holy Spirit, teaching them to observe all that I have commanded you, and behold, I am with you always to the end of the age. The authority that Jesus had transferred through His life, death, and resurrection to those who put their faith in Him, who repented of their sins to, to say that, Jesus, You are Lord. We want to follow You. We want to do what You had commanded us. That authority that came through His Spirit only started flowing and happening in my life in the classroom when I realized that it was done in the Spirit. It wasn't about me standing and saying, Well, I've got authority. I've got authority. It changed when I started saying, Hold on. I will arrive an hour before school starts because I'm going to do my devotions in class and I'm going to pray. I'm going to pray for these students. I'm going to pray for these chairs. I'm going to pray that God's kingdom will come through this pulpit that He had given me because that became my pulpit. That is where I realized that what Jesus was saying here to make disciples, this is where it's going to happen. 
It didn't make things easier. I, I'm telling you, I'm going to be honest, it, it became crazier. <laughs> because there were things that worked. Because the manifestations that I was seeing played out in the lives of these children were manifestations of the broken heart. Students who were struggling with the fact that there were no fathers, there were no mothers, there was drug addiction, there was alcohol abuse. And I was sitting with a bunch of people, young people, who were hungry and thirsty for truth and love. But the only example of authority in their lives had deserted them. And that is where it changed for me. Because I came to realize that before I truly live out the identity Jesus has called me to live out and what He has commanded me to do, before that comes to fruition in my life, I will not exercise authority in those spheres of influence in my life. question is, how about you? What does it look like for you currently in your life as a Christian, as someone who has already committed your life to Jesus? You have repented of your sins. What would it look like for you in your life if you started living with that authority, but it's not coming off out of a place of pride, but it comes out of the fact that you understand Jesus is the one who has all authority? How would that impact your work life? How would that impact your neighbors? How would that impact your first neighbor, which is your spouse, and then your children? How will that impact? trickle down into this community of Squamish. Imagine what it can look like if we gave the illusion of power and control over our own lives, if we gave that up and we said, Jesus, come and rule and reign. You have authority. You can tell us what to do. We'll do it. And what that can look like for you if you are not a child of God yet, if you are looking for identity this is a wonderful invitation that God gives you to say you can be one of His children. You can enter into a relationship with Him simply by acknowledging that you have a need for your sins to be forgiven, to confess it, and to say, Jesus, I trust in you. I repent of my sins. I want to follow you. And you join in with God's family the church. And that is what Glenn said in the beginning. That predominantly is walked out in community and family, in community groups, joining in with life, in the messiness of life with other people. And so if, if you haven't made that choice yet, this is today an opportunity for you to do that. And I trust and pray that you will consider Jesus that he is the one who has ultimate authority. Let us end off in prayer as the worship band maybe comes to the front. And we are going to sing one last song. And that is always an opportunity to respond to the gospel message. And the gospel that says that you can know God because of the blood of Jesus Christ. If you receive His forgiveness for your sins by grace. The worship band can come to the front and I'll just pray for us.